Well, this morning I got a message I'm very excited to speak about today. I'm preaching on living a legendary life. Living a legendary life. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the experiences this week that, and um, what, we, what we experienced, of course, with the, the death of Kobe Bryant a little bit and talk about um, just some things that God impressed upon my heart to share that really relates to all of us. And, um, and living a life that is remembered. And I'm going to preach about that here today. Father, I ask you, Lord, that as I deliver this message, that you would just pour life into all of us. And I thank you for the spiritual application that is always present in any situation by which you are moving and speaking and ministering to us. And I pray that today, Lord, that we would get something out of this, that we would learn and grow, and we would become better even through tragic circumstances we pray for their family. We pray for all those on the helicopter, the entire families that were represented for peace and healing. And, Lord, that somehow that their gra your grace of God would overcome them in a way they never even knew was possible in a tragic time like this. And we pray that today we would just grow and we would get closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week when I was in Florida, I was sitting on the plane getting ready to fly back to, like, Dallas and then to L.A., the connecting flights from Jacksonville and as I was on the plane, um, I get a text message from Joel Bacher, and he sent me a message that said, Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. And when, when, I, when I saw that, I stopped. I didn't believe it. I looked around, and I kind of looked around to see if anybody else was getting the same message or if this was something that was maybe um, false information or he got it from a wrong place or whatever. And within seconds, I could hear the ripple effect of everybody else starting to talk about what was going on. It was moving all the way to the back of the plane, and it was an unbelievable experience to see how quickly this news traveled. Within seconds, I can hear the gasp of people on the plane, and seconds after it, it was like getting through the streamline of people's messages and text messages. And, and then the news just kept getting worse. His 13-year-old daughter passed away, and then, and then others on the plane, and I just I kept wondering how worse could this news possibly get? And I was stunned because you've seen someone make so many game-winning shots. You see someone accomplish so many great things on the court. And you start to think that a person is, is bulletproof when you see so many heroic deeds that are being done. And I think the older that you get, you realize how, how life is so sudden. How life is such a vapor. And when you get older, you start to, to realize there's people that are around you in, in, in your sphere of influence that are starting to move on and pass away. When you're younger, you don't see it quite as much. But when you get older, you see people that, that you love go through difficult experiences like our, our wonderful Phyllis Lombardi who's dealing with a blood clot right now in her brain. And she reached a tragic place. So I want you all to pray for Phyllis. She's in Burbank. One of the great soldiers of this church, one of the greatest members of the board members, served here for years, for decades, has been a part of this church. We found out that she had a blood clot, and now she's in the hospital in her brain. And this is a very serious thing to pray for. She's they're going through surgery. And you see, you see people, and they go through these things, and the heartache and the pain and the struggles. And as life goes on, you start to understand that, that life is short and that, that people are dealing, and the people that you love go through health problems and and yesterday I took my son to the Clipper game and we walked by the crowd and I thought, to be honest with you, that going to the game in the afternoon that nobody would be there. And I walked around and crowds were everywhere and people were bringing um, all these different uh, flowers made of Kobe's jersey and little like memorials that they made and little cartoon sketches and all this amazing stuff. One guy brought a six pack of beer, he laid it right there. I mean, candles, everything. And... My son and I were driving up, and as we did to the game, he was deeply touched because he saw an older couple walking down Olympic Boulevard, and they parked kind of far away to get there, and, and they were walking with their, with, their, um, with their flowers in their hand, crying the whole time as they were walking down the street, getting ready to present those flowers, and something about that resonated in our heart. And, I, and as we look at his life, and, and, and of course, it's, it's never one of those things by you know, anyone's just any kind of supreme being because Kobe had flaws. We all have flaws. Every one of us do. And I understand that there are heroic people in everyday life who will get far less of a tribute. But what is it about Kobe Bryant's life that captured this amazing attention and reaction? What allowed him to live a legendary life? And I'm going to take a shot this morning at trying to explain uh, what, what we can learn from Kobe Bryant and his, his skill on the court and his dedication to the game and what we can learn in our own walk with God. 
You see, this extraordinary athlete, this man showed us many things. He showed us that hard work does pay off. He showed us how to play through pain. Remember this season when he had the dislocated finger? And he learned to shoot with four fingers because one of them didn't work. It bent in. And he literally had to shoot with four fingers and adjust his entire shot in order to become better. Even learning to shoot with the opposite hand. And this man showed us that just because you have influence and fame, it doesn't give you the right to give a half-hearted effort once you get on the court. That once you make your money, once you accomplish something great, that's not, that doesn't mean you cruise for the rest of your life. It pushes yourself. And there's a certain kind of, you know, celebrity to him and fame to him. But there's a certain kind of blue-collar aspect of a workman-like athlete that's somehow related to the common person out there in the street who was just trying to earn a living. And they went to a game and they bought the popcorn. They did all the things, you know, and cost, cost all the money to pay through parking, all of that. But they were able to go to a game, they, they somehow got rewarded by watching a person give it his best every single time. No one quite liked him in that way. And, and Kobe showed us many things, and now we know his life as he moved on, you know, um, from basketball. I think many of us thought that he would never quite adjust because he loved the game so much. He was so competitive. I thought that maybe he would shut down and not really enjoy the next phase of his life. But we saw the second part of his life, and sadly, we didn't get to see enough of it. As it played out in the life of his children and kind of learning from, from his growth and mistakes of life. And he began to become better in so many ways. And I, and I thought about after basketball and uh, this new person we were seeing that we never had a chance to really see. But it was too short to see it play, play out and it was heartbreaking. But Jesus had many times used illustrations as parallels to life or even the kingdom of God. He would say things like the kingdom of God is like a lost coin or the kingdom of God is like a man who buried his, his talent in the field and uh, use it as an as a illustration about squandering your life and burying your talents. Jesus was continually speaking in parables. If Jesus was around today, he would use a parable of someone's life or something that somebody went through in order to relate it to the common experience of our own life. And every time Jesus spoke, he spoke in parables and teaching lessons. And every night of my life, I couldn't wait till 740, man. And whenever the NBA season happened, I couldn't wait. Because 740, I knew that the Lakers would play. And, uh, and I knew that Kobe Bryant, man, would watch him play was the most rewarding thing. Every time the Lakers were on TV at 740, man. And Chick Hearn, if you're really old school, but, uh, uh, was he? Yeah, I think he was around during the Kobe era, right? And uh, he'd be announcing the game. And all this exciting uh, anticipation was starting to build. And, uh, and uh, why? Because every time he played, he would do something spectacular. He was so prepared in his game that when he actually got to a game, he was able to do something that was absolutely amazing on the court. And for years, I've been preaching about the power of showing up. But there's something more than showing up in life. It's showing up and being prepared in life that's even greater than just showing up. <laughs> prepared in your talent. Prepared in your attitude. Making the decision that you will live the kind of life that will impact others. And we were always aware that something extraordinary could happen simply because there was an athlete that was prepared and he showed up. And so, therefore, anything was possible. The reason why that Kobe Bryant was able to be someone that will be forever remembered is because of his preparedness. And he gave us the expectation of the spectacular. He gave us the expectation, whether it be 81 points, dunking on someone, crossing someone over and, uh, and, and doing a move or coming back from a 20-point deficit and giving his best. He prepared on the court so that the anticipation of what would be next would be in the appetite of those who watched. And I want to tell you this morning that God wants us to live our life in such a preparedness, in such a readiness that we live not just a life, but that we live a spectacular life. Jesus walked this earth, and you know what? There was the anticipation of the spectacular whenever Jesus walked on this earth. He would say something. He would do something. He would feed some, someone. But wherever Jesus went, because of his preparedness of being with the Father, because of his love of being with, the, with, with, with his Father, that he was able to do incredible things. There was an anticipation, not just because Jesus showed up, but because Jesus showed up prepared. And I believe that God is looking for a church that just doesn't show up on Sunday morning, but a church that shows up and we can't wait till 9.15 or 11, whenever we choose, because we know that there's going to be an expectation of something great. 
And I know you can feel this worship team prayed up this morning. There's an anticipation, an expectation of something great. And just like this athlete prepared himself to be great on the court, we ought to prepare ourselves spiritually to be great in life to where there's an anticipation of expectation that the world sees in the church. The world ought to never look at the church and see those, say, those are the people that have all these rules and regulations. They ought to look at the church and say, those are the people that if you're around them, something spectacular is about to happen because they are loved and love with their God and devoted. Jesus was spectacular. He walked around everywhere, and the Bible said he went around doing good. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about doing good. There was an expectation, anticipation. He said things in a religious day that no one else would say. He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Nobody said that during that time. In a day of rules and regulations, Jesus was speaking about faith that could move mountains, the impossible that could take place. He spoke in such a way. He lived in such a way that was miraculous. He would break away from the crowds and he'd run to the mountains to pray. He lived his life that way. And we can prepare our lives in such a way that when we walk through that door of life, when we walk through that door at home, our children can see us, and they don't just see us as parents, but because we love God so much and we're so ready to grow, they see somebody spectacular walking through that door. May our lives be spectacular. May our preparedness produce a spectacular life. May we prepare our lives before we walk into a situation, before we walk into a room, a winning spirit, an uplifting disposition. I mean, that's why I love people all the time that in this church I walk in there just so happy, just happy all the time. I walk around here, I see them. You know, and uh, whenever you're around them, you want to be better. We knew Kobe was the hardest working player on the court, but combined with talent, it created the anticipation for the spectacular. And God has given us all a talent. And if we choose to cultivate it, we can become spectacular and we can create a legacy in whatever we've been called to do. And yes, this athlete was a millionaire and celebrity, but there was a certain kind of grittiness that came to his game on the court. The idea that he had all the fame and money in the world, but he played every night like, like there was a scout watching him in high school and he needed to get a scholarship. And I found my tell, my, myself many times saying, I want that toughness on the court in my own life. I actually would watch that game and say to myself, I want to be able to fight like that for a victory. I found myself many times saying, I, I want to have the courage enough to, to show up when I'm injured, to play sick, and, uh, and to go the extra mile. And God wants his church to be that kind of church that goes the extra mile for the homeless and the hurting. God doesn't want the church to be ordinary and fit in. He wants us to be spectacular. We might not be the perfect church, but God's not looking for it. But he wants a church that, is, that has a hunger to be spectacular. We battle that complacency in our mind that says, cruise, coast, you've gone too far. Get older, get more bitter, get more callous, build up walls. Because the world will hurt you. And you got to protect yourself from the world. That's not a spectacular spirit. God wants us to live doing things against what our flesh wants to do in order to shine and to show the world that anything is possible. What, what you've done in the past, parent, is not what's going to def define your kid's opinion about you. It's what you overcome in the future. That's going to be the thing that they remember the most. And rather than looking at your children and saying, how poor of an example I have been, why not say, what kind of example can I be if I choose to cling to God and devote myself to his word and it becomes spectacular? The repetition of character, the repetition of a good attitude, the hunger and desire to be great in the character of God. Like an athlete that dazzles us with a competitive spirit. God wants us to live our life in such a way where the world looks at us and says they have something in them, a quality that is so tenacious and courageous and full of joy and passion. I want that for my life. In Matthew 5, 6, the Bible says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You talk about the mamba spirit, I mean, that's the mamba spirit right there. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. You hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. In other words, God is saying, I want you to have a competitive spirit against complacency in your own walk with God. I want you to get that grittiness. I want you to get that toughness. 
I want you to live with that fourth quarter spirit that says it's time to take it up another notch in my walk with God. I love it. The Bible says they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means that we compete against ourselves, not against anybody else. But we compete against our own potential. We compete against our own attitude. We compete against our own disposition. We compete against our own way. And whenever I would watch him play basketball, I thought to myself, God, give me the courage to compete against my flesh the way an athlete like that would compete against a scoreboard. And I think it's time that as believers, we stop blaming everything on the devil. And we just got in the spiritual gym and we just committed ourselves to God. That we stop unloading all of our problems to everybody else and just get a little bit tough. And say it's fourth quarter, I'm coming in the game, there's five minutes left. This is a time that I don't lose. This is a time that I get fired up. God wants us to have the kind of spirit that others are intrigued by. And that only happens by hungering and thirsting for righteousness. The attitude of the ordinary is not acceptable for God's kingdom. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will succeed. And in that success, you will live a life that others would want to duplicate. The enemy wants to numb your mind. He wants to get you to a place, whether it be drugs or not drugs, or just trials. That trials in the past can be a greater drug than, than drugs that people are taking. To live in this place of a numb, existing life where you lose the desire to compete. You lose the desire to want to grow. The greatest competition of our life is always going to be not us against anybody else. Not us against the bank or not us against our paycheck. The greatest battle in life will always be you against you on the inside. How much do I want to be different? How much do I want to change? And in that success, you will find what others want to duplicate. I literally, I know, I know I'm weird, but I used to watch that basketball game and say, I want that for my spiritual life. I want to be able to get tough. I want to be able to, like, fight and go to the extra level. And God wants us to look at our weakness the way that a basketball player develops their game. When, when LeBron James came into the NBA, he didn't have an outside shot. Remember when he came out of high school? We used to watch him play high school games on ESPN. And, his, and he used to just dunk on, like, like, you know, kids like my son in high school, like five foot nine, you know, kids. He used to remember those old videos of him playing just like, and he didn't have to really shoot outside because he could just drive whenever he wanted to and dunk. But when he got in the pros, he had to learn to shoot an outside game. He had to learn to take a weakness of his life and make it his strength. And uh, sad to say, as a Clipper fan, he's an absolutely wonderful outside shooter now. Why? Because he looked at his own life. He looked at an area. He started to compete against things in his life that were holding him back from going forward. Competing with our complacency, competing with our old attitude, co competing with our same routine, competing with our yearly spiritual growth. And now it's a new era and it's time to go to the next level. And God wants us to live a legendary life and that requires daily commitments to what God wants us to be. And in the life of extraordinary, the expectation of the extraordinary. If we can watch television and say, I wonder what's going to happen today. Remember that day where Kobe scored 81 points against the Raptors? I was going to go to that game. I was actually 99% committed, and then I got too lazy to go to the game. And I missed one of the greatest games of all time. I've done that so many times. I just got too lazy. I ended up watching it on TV. I was kicking myself. 81 points. I said, man, whenever I feel a whim to go again, I never, I'm always going to go because you never know what's going to happen on that court. But I missed that historic night. But his, his life was an example that the world can watch in amazement at the idea of showing up prepared and creating an appetite for anticipation. And that's what people did in the Bible. Noah committed himself to building the ark. Back when a day when no one even knew what a flood was, but he was out there every day and he was building that ark. And people were looking at him like, what in the world is this guy doing? Why is he building a boat out here in the middle of the desert? But he committed himself. He, he competed against his own self-interest versus what God wanted him to do. His battle was, am I going to be the Noah that gives up because a project takes too long? Am I going to be the Noah that gives up because everyone else says that I'm kind of unrealistic for what I'm doing? But is my battle going to be the battle of listening to what God wants me to do? I'll just keep doing it. Nehemiah, when he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, people were telling him to come down. The project is too great. You can't do it. But while he had, he had a sword in his hand and, and, um, and a prayer in the other hand up to God, and he committed his life to something. 
He gave the world a front row seat of what it means to hunger for obedience. And every day these people were mocked and they stayed the course. And while they were ridiculed, they saw something amazing being accomplished. You see, the very people that ridicule your desire to go forward are the same people secretly that are watching behind the scenes in amazement for the commitment that you have to the voice of God. I'm telling you, if you haven't been extraordinary in a while, it's time to be extraordinary. It's time to finish the program. It's time to dazzle the world. It's time to show those people that said, you've been an addict for so long in your life, you'll never come clean. It's time for them to watch you walk onto this stage. And it might feel a little bit good to prove them wrong, but more than all of that, the greatest motivation of your life will be to allow them to get a front row seat of just how great God is in someone's life. The anticipation for the extraordinary. Oh, man, I, I just pray. I, I believe it's happening, but it's going to hit greater measure. It's getting ready. I'm telling you, I believe it, Kelly. I believe it, team. I believe it. People are going to come into the house of God, and they are just going to be so ready. They are going to be so ready to worship. They're going to be so ready to see God. The things just, you never know what's going to happen. You come in the house of God, and, and uh, there's going to be this level of, of, of anything could take place, this anticipation. It's just like you can't wait for 740 to watch a basketball game or 710 to watch the Dodger game. You can't wait to show up into the house of God to be amazed at our great God. <laughs> they that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. It's time to be competitive again. Competitive against that numbing force in your brain that says, exist, 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 don't live, exist, don't live. But it's time to just do things out of the ordinary. Pray if, it hasn't, if you haven't prayed in a long time. Open up the word if you haven't done it in a long time. They were, people were hungry to do God's will. Live the kind of life that causes the world to get on the edge of their seat and want a front row seat to the commitment of your life unto God and to say, wow, look what I have just saw here on this stage. Look at this man dealing with HIV and going through all that he's gone through. And what happens? We're sitting on the edge of our seat in amazement. Why? Because he chose to, get, to cling to God. And now he went from someone looking at death's doorstep to someone that's living, anticipating the extraordinary. God wants us to live our life a certain kind of expectation of the extraordinary. And just like we watch an athlete dazzle us on the court and remind us of many values of working hard and committing yourself to the game, may we take those values and apply it to our determination to seek after God. Not everyone can score 81 points in the game. Not everyone will ever be on television. But the truth is your life can reflect a certain value and courage about it. That when you move on or you pass away, you will always be remembered for the legacy and the heartbeat and the kindness and the courage you lived your life and what you left behind. Every head about every eye closed all over this room today. I'm going to do something. Never, we're going to worship the Lord as we do. First of all, you're here and say, Pastor, I'm lost. I'm away from God. I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I only have anticipation of bad things or of destruction or death. And I, I don't want to live my life that way anymore. I don't want to live my life with that expectation of, of shame overcoming the future, fear overcoming faith. I don't want to live that life anymore. And today I want to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. Now is the time to be extraordinary because... When you, when you acknowledge Christ as your Lord and Savior, the extraordinary one now lives in you. You immediately have the potential to do great and mighty things because the creator of the universe lives in you and you've acknowledged your dependence on God rather than your own self-dependence. You've turned the keys and the license over to your, of your life to the creator of the universe. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. Get ready. One, the Holy Spirit is moving. Two. You're ready today. Now is the time. This is the place to say, Jesus, come into my life and wash me clean and be my Lord. I want to know you as Savior today. I want you to raise your hands across this room right now. Three, lift them up all over this room. They're going up. Hands are going up. People standing up. Hands are going up. Praise God. Everyone that's raising your hands, you that didn't, but I, you need prayer. and You want to know Christ today as your Lord and Savior. I want you to repeat these words after me loud and strong. Thank you, Jesus. 
for dying on the cross for me and shedding your blood that I might be saved. I repent of my sin and I gave you my life. Thank you for giving it all for me. Now I give you what I have left. And I ask you to multiply my life to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.